All right, everyone, welcome to what I consider to be this very special edition of the Fast Case Work From Home Wednesday series. I am thrilled, as always, for the people that are repeat customers. Um, one little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you attended the webinar last week on business interruption law and you did not receive my follow-up packet, please send me an email to the email address that is at the bottom of your screen presently. That is the same if you have attended our other Work From Home Wednesday presentations on student debt relief, on debt relief resources, our mini session on the Paycheck Protection Program, and our other mini session on batch access of statutory materials. If you're interested in recordings of any of those, as usual, just shoot me an email. Otherwise, today we're going to be having a conversation on the present state and the future state of legal AI, and we're gonna do it with a very special guest, Mr. Joshua Walker. Uh, who is the author of On Legal AI. Um, and the last little bit of housekeeping we're gonna talk about is this is an information session only. As much as I wish that I could, I cannot give you CLE credit for this session. However, for any of you that want to get your CLE credit out of the way, please make sure you check out fastcase forward slash webinars, where I have a nice, fresh library of live sessions available for you free of charge, for anywhere between four plus hours of CLE credits. All right, with that out of the way, I'm going to turn it over to Joshua Walker to tell us a little bit about himself and start the conversation about legal AI. Great, and just hearing a little bit of interference on the line, so uh, let me know if I can be clearer. Thanks, thanks so much to all of you. Thanks so much to Fastcase and, and Ken and Aaron on the line. Um, I just say, I know people are exhausted with COVID um, information, but I would just say courage. You know, I hope as much as there's a massive turmoil in this country and, and uh, overseas that we make it our, you know, finest time uh, as opposed to where we become more fractious and everything. So I just say courage and thank you for taking the time. Um, we're going to be focusing on something that is not purely, you know, COVID related. Um, and in that, uh, but I do want to thank um, in particular Fast Case. Um, they're amazing humans as well as great professionals and have a lot of resources in this, in this period. Uh, so my name is Joshua Walker. I wrote a book called On Legal AI, which um, uh, uh, Steve and Ed had uh, just gratefully, graciously decided to publish a little while ago. Um, and I've been doing this stuff for about, strangely enough, it's about 30 years um, and longer than I've, I've been to law school. And um, on legal AI, when I, when I started a company, we started a company called Lex Machina in about 2006, um, back when it was really crazy to put the word, even using the word AI was something you didn't do, at least not in Silicon Valley, if you want credibility. And certainly adding the word legal to AI or CS was considered very insane, right, at, at the period. But even back then, you know, uh, uh, one of the things that we wanted to think about was democratizing access to, uh, to data. And I think one of the things that, that Fastcase does is um, they just make it easier to access all of these things. So that's a sincere statement and uh, uh, I'll stand by it and, and give evidence for that. So again, my background's in AI. Um, the, the book tells stories. Um, when we were starting our company, Lex Machina, uh, one of the books I read was called Founders at Work. And all it is is like the number two or three person at different startups and at different companies, Google, Yahoo, whatever, and they just told stories, said, here is what happened. And more than any other business book I've ever read in my life or any other technical book, frankly, those types of either historical narratives or personal stories to me were way more valuable than a kind of a business school, you know, proceed on how you should lead and strategic management and all that stuff. Those can be great, um, but I think telling the stories is even more important. So that's what's in the book. Please take a look. It's on the Fast Case website and in uh, PDF and, and physical version. And yes, we still like physical books sometimes. So what is AI? I'm going to start with the punchline before I talk um, more about myself, because uh, that's probably something I do a little too much. And I, I care about What's your ROI right now on this on this webinar? 
And one of the things that Ken had asked us to talk about was really, you know, right now, what's what, what are the current best uses for, for AI, right? You're familiar with some of them. I mean, every time you use Google, that's, that's sort of AI-enabled information extraction. Every time you do legal research these days for citations, again, there's a lot of cleaning and extraction that's being done both by new entrants and then traditional entrants in, in legal research, the ones that provide things for free um, or, or at low cost, the fast case, Justia, others, um, and the ones that are, are you know, Lexis or Westlaw. They're all using AI at this point, so you are a user of this stuff, wouldn't want to not. That's kind of old news, though, right? Um, the next two, I think, big chunks of activity where, where um, folks that are either law students, especially law students right now, because you're probably much better prepared to apply the technology than um, you know, earlier generations were. Um, much more agile in how you're adapting to things and much more valuable in some ways because of that freshness of exposure to, to, to technology um, throughout your, your law school careers and through your early um, associateness. Um, contract AI is another big area that used to be very difficult to do. When I say contract AI, I mean something very specific. So contract AI tools, um, they are not radically changing what anyone's doing or analyzing. They're not eliminating work. What they're doing is they're actually enabling people to um, uh, do far more work uh, per, per, per review cycle. So according to a lot of people I've talked to, both um, you know, accountants and consultants as well as law firms, using a contract AI tool that's good, uh, it can increase your productivity by about eight times. So that's an area where, and again, I don't know where that's, that some of that could be puffery, but there is some real value into organizing data and being able to extract out information from that. What is contract AI? So I'm talking about contract abstraction. You're looking for certain clauses. They could be GDPR. They could be anything else. And the ability to extract and find those clauses with statistical, you know, efficiency and accuracy and relative and legal accuracy, both of those things. That's a really hard task, but that's being done pretty consistently um, with a, a number of different tools. Akira is one I like a lot. Uh, eBrevia is also another really good tool. Um, there's massive investment into this space, though, for managing contracts. And it's an enormous problem. But I'd say just reviewing contracts, you really should be using some AI tool at this point, whether through your clients or, or directly. Um, the reason that can create work for lawyers is historically, if it costs you know someone four hundred thousand dollars to do a, a deal contract review or um, on every single contract or every single potential contract, it was impossible. Right? They just didn't want to spend the money. Um, if you can do that for fifty k, it means you're getting a lot more deals. Inside corporations, um, a lot of the contract review is given to non-lawyers, and there's reasons for that. But the biggest reason, though, is that we haven't historically we've been great at reviewing contracts, but no one wants to talk to us, right? Because we're gonna, they're afraid we're gonna shut down their deals, uh, slow things down, uh, and that we're not gonna be efficient about things because we're gonna do the right stuff, the things we do. Using contract AI, lawyers can actually take a lot more of that work and preserve, or actually, you can actually improve your legal acumen using these things. Um, rather than being, you know, relegated to the, you know, the photocopy department where you're just, you know, stamping things and um, checking the box and then doing some project management of outside lawyers. This is a case where it's a growth area, and I think lawyers should lead uh, in contract analysis and review, which we're trained to do it. We know what the law is, and there's too many other, you know, uh, elements in this world that can really cause harm to companies. Uh, if the contract doesn't match what the legal rights should really be uh, allocated towards. So contract abstraction, right? Contract review. Very simple uh, in, in theory, uh, hard to do in execution, and you should look to people that, that the big law firms use and uh, small law firms use. Um, they can be expensive, um, obviously, so that's something to think about. But increasingly, there's going to be more open source tools that can do part of that work or at least some of the initial organizational work. At, at, at very low cost. And you'll see that market keep expanding. You'll see more investment into it. The bigger issue in contract AI is making contracts that are good. That is first and foremost still a drafting problem. You know, even when I was, we were starting a legal startup in a, in a recession, 
and, and there was a lot of great talent available that, that probably wouldn't have been around, you know, a few years before then. My biggest problem was finding people that could read and write well, right, and argue well and articulate and synthesize the data. That is a liberal arts skill set, and it is the, at the core, in my view, of contract and every other kind of text, textual related legal AI is reading and writing well. Engineers cannot replace you, right? The, the, um, and, and, um, but you need to leverage um, the tools we need to harmonize and create a diverse, diverse sort of solution set so clients don't have to pay 400K for a 25K problem. Uh, or, or you can, you can, and you can do a lot more. You're enabling a much bigger network, as, as uh, um, uh, a lot of Kira and others have, have mentioned. Getting contracts that are good, that's an enormous problem. It's not going to be solved within five years, but there's going to be massive attempts to do so. A lot of these are being led by kind of very engineering focused firms. They're looking at law as text. Others are really hybrids between lawyers and, uh, and engineering teams. So, I expect that to, to, to grow and change, but it's not going to get solved anytime soon because actually making contracts that reflect what people are doing and are enforceable and make sense, we're terrible at this. I mean, we're just, we're not even close to solving, you know, how do you get a third party to do stuff and make sure it's efficient and easy to do? That's an enormous problem. We haven't even scraped the surface of it yet. Um, but at times, there's going to be overinvestment, right? Because it's a new area, it's hot, you know, all revenue goes through contracts, that's a big one. The second place where there is a lot of practical AI, where I, I just wouldn't want to, if there were data available in my space, I would not want to litigate anything without data, right? And I'm not just referring to citation analysis, research. I'm referring to um, the ability to actually dig down into this stuff and say, who's going to win and lose in these things? This judge, what does she like doing? Is, is there a certain type of motion um, that uh, she can't, she, she doesn't tend to grant, or if she grants it, when? What's the history of this stuff? You know, Santayana is quoted by Churchill said, you know, those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. When we were, we were pitching Lex Machina people, we, we said this, we said, Look, it's not about data, quote unquote, right? This stuff is, is history. And if you're spending huge amounts of client money on a, on a type of summary judgment motion that has never won before, right? Uh, that's, that's a tragic mis misuse of your, your brain power, your time, and your, your client's resources. So we shouldn't do that. We have an ethical duty to actually figure out the right strategy using that. The other use for this, the reason that we caught on like wildfire initially was because lawyers, even in patent, weren't historically huge data users, but they're competitive, right? If one, if one firm has, and it's very, we're very status conscious as a group, right? So if one law firm that's a peer law firm or a peer, you know, practitioner has something, they want it too. And so even in a recession, there was a, there was a big need for that. There was a big need by companies to solve the kind of the, uh, some of the patent um, friction that had been in the system, we'll say, uh, and um, litigation data is really, really important. We can dive into that a little bit later, um, uh, Ken, if you like. The the you have to remember though that it's a, a it's a two way it's a window, not not just a mirror. So when you're looking at this data, the judges are looking at you, and if you're engaged in frivolous behavior or frivolous notions, the world is going to start to see these types of things. There are many areas in the U.S. where practice or the domain of law, and again, I, I love law. I think it's, uh, I, it's, it's where my heart is. Uh, it's what I've been doing for a long time, um, and I believe in the justice system. But there are domains that are just full of abuse and predatory behavior by people. There's predatory behavior without law. There's also predatory behavior by people that abuse systems um, of all, on all sides, right? And so to be able to figure out what's going on and what's right and what's wrong. Having data and transparency with the judges uh, is really important. Quick use case and then we'll move on. Uh, we were producing um, litigation, empirical litigation data, starting with patent. Um, we did uh, all the other sort of IP types except trade secret, uh, which is being done now, because uh, there was no trade secret data at the time that was available. It wasn't a, a cognizable federal claim. And um, in about 2012, uh, the administration uh, signed into law the American Invents Act. The American Invents Act said, hey, 
we're Congress and we're going to ask the GAO, General um, Accountability Office, the, the Comptroller General of the U.S. to say, what's going on with this patent rule stuff? What's happening? And so we had to uh, very competitively pitch our solution. Uh, there were other people that were going to do it for free. I had to, I had to you know, staff it. So we had to charge a small amount um, just to cover our, our costs as a small startup. And we were able to win the, the bid to do the analysis, the first analysis for, you know, who are the people that are filing patent lawsuits, right? Not using rhetoric, not being on any side, uh, but saying, what does the data say? And what we said is, look, there's a lot of rhetoric in patent litigation. People are really upset about it on both, both ends. Some people say the sky is falling if we reduce patent coverage, other people. And again, if you don't care, care about patents, great. This is a use case that can apply to any situation at all, right? So, um, Essentially, uh, we said there is a spectrum of plaintiff types. Some of them get a lot of money from patent licensing. Some of them are purely patent licensing. Some of them don't do it at all for now. Um, there's a spectrum. But what the GEO found is that the invalidity rate, the rate at which um, a federal judge found a claim of a patent that had been issued by the PTO invalid, was about 95% for software patents about 30% for semiconductor, but 95% for software, which is crazy. You can think of this almost like a quality control system in a factory with really new things, you know, DNA patents, you know, uh, uh, it could be, could be testing patents, blood testing patents. You know, we're not quite necessarily as good in all cases at, at doing the actual patent filings. So the system discovered this, more and more people started looking at it you know, we pitched the Senate, the White House, uh, and just showing them data, damages data, things that were anomalies really in the system. And this stuff got fixed, not because of us, but because the data became available. So when you hear AI, and we had a lot of AI tools that we were doing and sitting in a basement with computer scientists to go through summary judgment orders and dockets, and that's a long story, um, if, if, if we're interested. But at the end of the day, the system being able to see where the problems were can be revolutionary. Engineers do this all the time. There's a lot of, a lot of dangers, that, a lot of risks that engineers have in terms of their training. Um, people can be arrogant. They can think that engineering project management can solve all HR problems. And, you know, there's other dangers. There's hubris in, in every profession. But one of the things they do that I love is they do models and simulations, and they do testing, and they use data. And whether we call the data or history in the law, I think it's, it's really important to use empirical data. So um, as, you, as you're seeing, when we start to go from litigation and contract AI, you can really quickly get into policy and system design. How is the system functioning, right? How is any given domain, you know, securities law, admiralty law, what's it doing? Is it doing what it's supposed to do? And do we have something better than rhetoric to figure out if our system of government is working? So we start with litigation AI, but we quickly move into system design for nation states. What's happening, right? Forget about the politics. Let's, let's be in the empirical party for a moment and say, what's going on in the system? What do the data say? Don't trust anyone's speech, but like what does the underlying evidence suggest? So that's a, those are two big uses, or three big uses really, is contract AI, litigation AI. Um, and Ken, before I keep going, other questions that, that sort of come to rise or that I can I dig in on those two or just uh, keep going? No, um, so I've, I have a couple of great questions to follow up on your, your earlier discussion. Great. So one uh, important question is, do you have any suggestions uh, or key points to bring up to law firm partners to encourage them to adopt AI tools, such as the contract AI tools you referenced earlier? Yes, so there is a, there is a very simple way to do it, and I can tell you exactly how to happen. I, I'm, I'm not gonna say which law firm, I can say it's one of, it was a top Silicon Valley law firm, and there was someone in the firm that needed it, and, and we were you know, fighting to survive. Right? There, were, there were a dozen things that could kill us, so I was, I, I was, I was careful about giving away free passes because I really need to use your system. You know, can you, can I use it for a little bit? This, uh, he was of counsel, uh, right? So it wasn't an associate, but he was of counsel. And his partner asked him some questions about, like, he figured something out that was, like, really unusual. Like, we found, like, some gold, right? Just some usual, like, crazy things in the data. We figured out how to invalidate a patent in about a 10-second search. 
with something that shouldn't even been on the system. So it was like some gold bit of data that that probably saved their client a hundred thousand dollars, whatever. And again, I'm not that money focused, but it's important to think quantitatively when we're looking at this because the law firm partners are thinking that way, your clients are thinking that way, the CFOs are reviewing everything. So the the partner goes, "How did you figure that out?" And he goes, "Well, I have this little tool, and here it is." And that was the that was our I think that was our first like large commercial sale, right? Uh, uh, certainly in the Valley. There were other, other donors that had, that had been involved in the past, investors, but um, that was our first big deal. And he, had, he was able to use it for free and he just saw how valuable it was because it, it, it was a very large ROI for that case. People didn't use the tool that like, they're not like, it's not like Twitter or Facebook where they're on all the time and it's addictive. It, they're going on there for very specific reasons. Um, the second reason it caught on is because people used it for sales pitches. If you're pitching for a case in, you know, Georgia, uh, you know, and you've never been in that district before, all of a sudden you can figure, oh, here's this judge. I know every single thing. You may know more than the local council does if they don't have access to it. So democratizing access. So helping win pitches and helping win cases, like, and, and, and using, getting access to the tool, a trial access, if you can do it. And, um, you know, that's, that's how you win. And you almost... I'm not saying be surreptitious about it, but, and you have to comply with the, the license terms, but prove it, right? Use the tool. Don't talk about it. Too many people talk about AI. Too many people talk about legal AI. How does it help your clients, right? Use a tool, get trial access, finagle access to something, or find a low cost version of it and do it. Um, and, and they will, and, and they, they can follow up. Right now, budgets are tightening. So every dollar they're going to spend, which per rata comes out of every partner's, you know, per pocket, right? So every dollar they spend is going to get scrutinized. You have to show what the ROI is for, for that tool, um, whatever. It doesn't have to be AI, right? It can be, it can be anything. Um, there are certain things you can do for free. Again, uh, in an M&A context, um, we use litigation data a lot, but uh, even on, on deal work, but we, um, I remember one deal where, um, you know, the other side, very, very famous IP person saying, oh, we can't give you this term on this trademark deal because of blah, blah, blah. Then I look, but, and I said, oh, but you gave it on your last three deals. End of discussion, we got the term we needed. And it was like most of the value of the IP was in that term. So if you do empirical research, even just looking online, right, sometimes the data is not perfect. Everything is a mess. You have to you have to be really humble about these data sets, but prove its value uh, and and go from there. I Ken, mean, I don't know if I addressed that question, but happy to dive in or, or take another question too before we move on. Yeah. Um, so this may be an unrelated question, but this is focused on all of my law students out there. Um, so the question posed is: Can AI be used in law schools or other university settings to identify? early predictors of bar exam passage or to help identify the most effective teaching strategy for a law school? Wow. So as I understand it, that's a question of, you know, for, so for law firm libraries, um, I think you can certainly look at data, but I, I'm not aware of anything that's going to, you know, especially not a quote unquote legal AI tool that's going to go out and tell you, how to pass the bar exam or how to better teach it. I'm a believer in one-on-one -on -one instruction. Um, I think that um, what I would do is I would, you know, certainly search for data on these types of things. Sometimes the bars themselves have, have analyzed it, um, but you do that and then use your network. Say, I noticed, you know, law school XYZ in Poughkeepsie or Winnipeg or, Sorry, I don't want to take, but uh, it must are Canadians online, but Chicago or, or, or Palo Alto. I noticed you've got this, you know, you've done really well on this. Can I just ask you about how you do it or, you know, what the background is for it? And they might know something. Um, so uh, having that um, converse, using qualitative data, like talking to people, is really important to sort of supplement what you find online. So deep question. I'm, I'm really not an expert in, the, in that area, but I would, I would sort of sweep for data uh, statistics, but I, then I would like talk to a lot of people about what happens. And it may be that, oh, well, we always make sure we give them an extra three months before the bar or, 
yeah, but, you know, it may, it may be like not something they're teaching. It may be something else, but um, I would, I would try to find out and I would look for outliers, right? People that do really well, you know, um, you know, despite that they may not have a ton of resources and they might not have fancy firms that are paying for you know, three months of study beforehand. I would look for outliers um, and then try to figure out how they, uh, what they do and how they do it. And um, anyway, that's a, that's a quick answer on that. I'm, 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 but I'm certainly not an expert on the subject of bars though. Um, the next topic I want to talk about, we have, uh, I was recently on a task force for the state of California um, called a tilts. It was really about, um, I'm not going to uh, uh, make you suffer under the, the full acronym. It was about expanding access to justice using technology. Right. Can a piece of software actually conduct a representation or carry out a legal function? Right. An example of a legal function is they look at some documents or some statutes and they apply that legal situation to a, a specific human. Right. It's not it's not just like no low. It's like not it's not like here's the law and here's the procedure. It's like we're applying this law to you. And the answer is, you know, duh. I mean, we we have to do this at some point. Um, and the reason that we have to uh, is that, um, and this, this goes back to the early, earlier question about how you sell this stuff internally and, and, and in general to clients. We are, in California, we're missing like 95% of the demand for legal services. It's the poor, it's the middle class, it's the rich. It, everyone is not using legal function uh, because it's too expensive and too difficult and it's painful. And how do you find the right person, right? So why isn't it like Google? Like, why don't we still have physical maps anymore? Well, because we have restrictions on this for good reason. Um, we don't want unethical behavior. We don't want engineers running legal, uh, legal fields. But what that's done, what the, the, the bar has done is it's also crippled us, right? It's also prevented um, outside capital from coming in. You know, lawyers don't, investing in R&D for a lawyer is really difficult for a law firm because they're LLPs. So unlike Google or unlike, um, you know, Amazon, they can't just invest money and look at the return in a few years, maybe different partners, and, and that, that the people's salaries are tied to what, you know, neg negatively to what they invest in any given year. So we've crippled our, ourselves by providing this protective ring. But we're all old school, you know, uh, we, we, most of us, you know, really believe in the ethics rules very, very strongly. And um, they're there for good reason. We, we avoid, you know, there's a notorious problem. People who are not qualified or giving legal advice about immigration it causes massive harm uh, in the world. So we have this thing, and, it, and ultimately it's moving towards a recommendation. We hope to have a kind of, a, they call it an AI sandbox, where people are like fast cases AI sandbox. Um, that story is going to be a little bit featured more in the next book coming out in the summer on AI. That's um, a general AI book, like an introduction to AI and, and business applications. But what I was shocked by, by the, was by the violence of the reaction of certain members of the bar um, and I don't think it was most. I think it was a, a, a very vocal group within different areas. And the fear was, you're going to let Amazon take over the law. And the reality is, anything, we, anything that's going to be done is going to be done in a tightly regulated fashion. Um, the answer to the fear that, oh, you're going to enable anyone to give legal advice and you can enable Amazon to take over the law, it's like, that is happening now. Our people aren't getting legal advice. There is massive, massive injustice in this state, massive, right? And it's painful and it impacts everybody and no one's doing anything about it. And lawyers are losing work and the people aren't getting served. So we need to use things like, you know, contract AI to help make us more efficient. We need to orchestrate these things. You can have lawyers managing technology products, right? But you need to reach more people. And if you can reduce the cost of analysis, for any given legal operation or, or analytic uh, function, you can help more people, right, ethically, right? That's the, that's the hope. And we want to do small controlled experiments like Utah to, to try to cheer up further that. Um, again, putting our heads in the sand exposes us to risk. Amazon doesn't need a change in the rules to take over certain elements of legal practice and sort of referrals, even in the referral world. 
right? They, they can do that without us. Where, where we're going to be really crippled is if we don't have the ability to leverage AI tools, leverage the economies of scale. Here's why, right? Software, you build it once, it's a high fixed cost to build it, right? It's like, like making a movie, right? It's a very high fixed cost. But then each operation, each viewing, right? Each time it's used, it doesn't cost you anything. It's almost zero marginal cost for that. That means the cost of serving 2 million people or 2 billion people is incrementally close to zero or relatively low, right? It's not zero, um, as opposed to a lawyer doing everything manually, right? So I'll give you a very clear example in AI. When we were building our company, uh, we had, um, you know, there, there was a precedent project for what we did for Lex Machina, which is an IT clearing house. Someone had done a database on securities class action at, at Stanford Law School, right? And they have about, it's about 250 securities class actions a year in the U.S., at least at the time, and it's all public. We had to handle about 120,000 cases. Any one of those cases could have 9,000 different events. Most of the data was secret based on damages and settlement. Uh, we were going to die of old age before anything useful came out of this, right? And so what I started doing, and this is just a, you know, synodoke, but it was me sitting in a basement with a machine learning person going through summary judgment orders or going through the docket and saying, this is this type of event, this is this type of event. We built a language that automatically extracted things. It was tested and retested. The judges had free access to it. Academics had free access to it. Lawyers and companies had access to it. So the amount of utility that that, you know, summary judgment finder could produce was very, very high because it could run over the entire, you know, federal corpus of lawsuits in the world, you know, all of the docket and find with pretty good accuracy something that was a summary judgment order or a markman order or, or something else. And we could download it and then we could do extraction within that and it goes on and on and on. The amount of value provided from that brutal time of, you know, two years of my life sitting in a basement coding stuff, um, it, 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 the system is better than I would have been uh, flagging those different events. Now, I wasn't, wasn't practicing law, but there was a lot of law in it. And there's a lot of jobs doing these types of things, in compliance, fintech, other areas that aren't pure you know, law firm traditional areas um, that are accessible probably to library science, probably to um, certain lawyers. So you're much more efficient if you can leverage a piece of technology and software, if you're humble about deploying it to make sure it's legally accurate, you have a lot of eyes, you know, to, to many eyes, especially judicial and academic eyes, all bugs are shallow. So we have to use technology to scale ourselves. But the violence of the reaction, the fear of AI um, is, is, could, again, keep, continue to cripple the profession. In my view, that's going to just shrink and shrink. And, you know, if people avoid us because they think we're zombies or they think we're not efficient or they think we can't solve problems creatively, um, that's going to just, again, keep decreasing the scope of things that we can work on. Contract AI and other things like that, they can increase it. Using litigation AI, you can prevent lawsuits before they happen. We can tell, we're using the same data we had for ICE litigation at, at, at a company I'm working at now where we're selling, you know, quality of intellectual property reports, right? It's report on here's the value of your IP, right? We can use it to sell insurance to avoid it. We can use it to avoid problems before they exist. If you, you can know that someone you're trying to do business with is, is very litigious. That, those data are, are foundationally important for practice today. And I think, Regardless of the bar passage question, I think it's something we need to be teaching in law schools as well. So, Ken, did I address your first first questions at least? Yes. Um, and do you have any time Good. for a few more? Because we've got some great ones. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's roll. And again, if you if you want the story, uh, again, please read the book uh, on legal AI, uh, on uh, legal AI. And uh, if you care about the, the sort of history of this, there's the Harvard Law School thing uh, with me on YouTube that just tells a, a narrative about it. But I'd love to just focus on your question. Thanks. Go ahead, Kim. Perfect. So one is about uh, your favorite or probably least favorite topic, legal ethics. So if an AI analysis of bad actors, of something like those who file frivolous motions, would you say mm -hmm. that that analysis should result in an identification of those bad parties or those, let's say, abusive actions for um, uses such as official discipline or warnings by, let's say, a bar association? 
Um, so my answer is no, and uh, I'm gonna. Uh, but but it but it doesn't. But the the real answer is, you know, is going to reveal something about what AI is, and gonna, is going to enable that type of analysis. So AI, no. Data and evidence, yes. So for every time we said there was an outcome of a given type or that there was a, even there was a Markman order, the user didn't have to trust us. My motto for all these things is assume all data are false until proven otherwise. AI is not going to tell you anything. You can't use a deep, you know, convolutional neural network, right, which is a bit of a black box to determine, oh, this that behavior is unethical. You can't do that, right? It's, it's, it's procedural and it doesn't protect people and it may be, it may be biased, right? As, as many of you know, there's massive bias that can be introduced. You have to see it. Law is special in the AI application realm for that reason. What you can do and what judges are doing is saying, before they just, they'd see one lawyer in court and they'd have no idea what they're doing in their other cases unless they talk to other judges randomly in the same way that partners talk to each other. Sometimes say, hey, have you had this client or have you had this situation, right? That there's information sharing, but it's ad hoc and, and limited because of that, because of time. Now that same judge can pull a search on that lawyer and look at every single motion they filed and what happened. So there was a, a magistrate judge at ND Cal. Um, they were they were my my favorite. I think one of my favorite clients, uh, Judge Von Walker, and ND Cal was famous for um, uh, for a lot of reasons for human rights cases. Really, uh, was was a client at the time. And one of his magistrates said, "Now I could say like, hey, if if lawyer X says, Your Honor, I'm going to win this motion, and he can he can say back, you have done ten of these in the last two years. You've won zero of them." You are wasting our time, right? So, and if they, if someone, if you see someone who keeps filing frivolous motions, you can find that almost instantaneously now. And they will. Uh, and hopefully they'll do it for more and more cases, right? Because the domains that are with that behavior might exist more, maybe in criminal law, it may be in, in um, family law, which is full of abuse, right? Full of massive abuse of system and animus. So, you, the AI is not going to tell you anything. You can't use a convolutional neural network to say something is unethical. You can use AI to find evidence, and that is what we use it for. It's not to tell you what the ethical uh, rule is. It's to find data, to find that evidence. You never trust it, right? You always want to look at the, the document, the sign, the signature of it yourself and confirm it. The AI just helps you find it to do the thing you want it to do anyway. So, uh, yeah, I hope I answered that question, but uh, uh, happy to keep going. Oh, and, yeah. and before we do, let me define artificial intelligence right now, because I think this is important for us. Um, I define, in, in the book, I define artificial intelligence as a marketing meme covering a variety of advanced mathematical and computer science techniques and systems. Specifically, these techniques and systems involve or incorporate algorithms enabled by constraints, exposed by representations that model thinking, perception, and action. It's a long-winded story. That's from, that's from the, the bottom part of that is from Patrick Winston, an MIT professor, uh, not me. But it's a marketing meme right now. So it's really math and data, right? So uh, one of my colleagues in another book says, you know, math is the father of AI and data is the, is the mother, right? Uh, take it for what you will. The idea is, this isn't anything new. This is, this is mathematics or applied mathematics and a set of data. Every time someone applies that math, like a lawyer, like you, like anyone in a startup or anywhere else, they are using their own perceptions, bias, all, of, all the whole shebang. And the, the quality of the data is enormously important. The math just helps you analyze it faster. It doesn't change the data, uh, or it shouldn't, uh, and, and certainly not in the legal context. It just helps you man organize it. So what is the quality of the data? Is it a federal judgment? Is it, you know, something that somebody says? Is it uh, something in a newspaper article? All valuable information, but they have different evidentiary value and different, different um, legal state right, value, if you will. So um, the, the definition of AI is really important to keep in mind. It's just math and data. Don't look to it as a as an autonomous thing. Um, it's just it's just math and data at the, at the end of the day. And I would I would start with that. As people do more with more autonomy, great. But the big mistake in the AI 
technical world has been over promising and under delivering as that ratio starts to shift a little bit, stay on the humble side and assume all data are false until proven otherwise. And, and assume that every AI tool you have, even if it's just looking at dockets or uh, looking at contracts or looking at anything else, they're all different. Somebody made a judgment somewhere and more likely than not, it's a mess. So, so do your diligence. And that, and that's why, like, I think the library function at, at, at firms is going to be more important. We just have to be agile, keep moving and, and democratize access, keep pushing the envelope in terms of how we analyze these things. My favorite thing to do as, as a young associate was, was really to look at, especially in litigation, was to look at the data, like what was going on in the case, uh, reviewing the documents, because that's the heart of how you generate everything else. Um, yeah, Ken, happy to uh, uh, take more but, uh, or dive in uh, as you like. Sure. So we have another question. A shout out to uh, one of our librarians, Aaron, um, who asks, when you're using AI to deal with contract interpretation, how do you, when you're using these, products or this technology, how do you ensure that your contract work continues to improve qualitatively and does not just become more homogenous? So over time, let's say if you use AI more and more for a review of your contract, yes. does, it, does it continue to improve? Do they continue to improve qualitatively? Or in your experience, do they simply become more homogenous? I guess is a better way to ask that, that question. Yeah, that's a, that's a profound question. Uh, I think the answer is it's too early to tell. We're still in the first, um, back in, back in a world where there was something called sports that they had quarters uh, of a game. So I think we're in the first quarter of the contract AI game, maybe the second for litigation AI. We're just scratching the surface. We don't know what the impact will be. Um, I think what happens in a lot of these cases is people get, uh, they just start spinning their wheels and doing more and more analysis. Um, so let me answer your, the question in a different way. For M&A, like mergers and acquisitions activity, the deal terms are becoming more standardized. Lawyers are being brought in later. Okay, and the reasons for that are economic. It's they don't people don't want to build things until the, the, the M&A deal is really likely to go ahead, and you know who the buyer is and all that sort of stuff. So standardization is happening with or without us. They may be standardizing on bad things. We may still have a bunch of terms and contracts that are done. Like they're just like vestiges from some, we don't know why they're there. Um, so I think in every contract review, what does the text say? What is the situation? And does this text and situation make sense or not? I think most of the time people are just, it's just, you know, ah, there's some text and there's some things and I gotta move things around and no one's looking at the intrinsic value of these contracts and no one's looking at whether they work or not. Why do we have these terms in there? Like, we shouldn't just be managing text, managing data. It's like, this is, is this contract working, right? And if it's not working, maybe it's not just the contract, maybe it's not the four corners, maybe it's the, the party, maybe the party is crazy, right? And, or they're just, they just lie, or they're, you know, they're not a good partner. Maybe they're a great partner and the contract is bad, right? So, yes. I think I think standardization. I don't want to call it homogenization. Is happening with or without us? I think an analysis. I think gathering data about what are the different contracts out there. It doesn't hurt us. Knowing more is always helpful, but it's it's only a piece of what I want to know. When I, I went back to practice from Les Machina to to a, a, was it a firm called Simpson Thatcher in, in the Valley, they were using the tool a lot. But like you could help people as a lawyer in ways you can't. As a, as a technology purveyor. And so, because you can think about what's the situation, what are the relationships like, what is our bargaining power, is the other lawyer obnoxious or good, um, and what the enterprise wants to know is, are their contracts performing or not? Are they hurting revenue or helping it? Are, they, are, are there things where they're, they're getting renewals on contracts that, are, that shouldn't be renewed? So, um, I think that's, uh, um, you know, uh, essentially, these are profound questions. I, I think data is only part of it. Um, I wouldn't get bogged down and spinning your wheels on analysis. Um, I wouldn't presume that because something is standard, it's good. That's a whole different exercise. And so what I'd say is the, the contract analysis view is an infinitely complex problem. We'll never get to the end of it. Because it involves finance and law and operations and things, you know, groups that never talk to each other. 
be diverse, keep an open mind, but yeah, get the data. So anyway, I'm happy to, I don't know if I answered that question, but uh, hopefully we've uh, uh, begun, begun to. Yeah, so I think uh, I will I will give one more and then we'll let you finish up because I know everyone's time is valuable. I wanna thank everyone for staying with me throughout the session. So the last question is very general. So it is essentially asking, what do you have any opinions on two things? Number one, do you have any opinions or thoughts on the robot lawyer announced via the do not pay application? And number two, do you have any opinions or thoughts on virtual mediation? Uh, yes, I do. And look, listen, I, I know some of the people in, involved in, in some of these things. Um, there was a do not pay app based in London and, um, you know, Robot Lawyer's a really interesting project. Um, Ironically, we, we had started a, a, um, a center, we're trying to start a, a center at Stanford in about 2004, uh, and someone said, oh, so it's robot lawyer, and then that almost killed it. <laughs> so now it's a good thing to be a robot lawyer. Back in the day, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was death. Um, I, I, you, you have to follow the ethical rules when you do these things, uh, first of all. Um, you can expose people to harm if you don't tell them what to do and how to do it. But I applaud the, the idea that we can provide utilities to consumers within highly regulated, you know, domains. Um, you know, what's happening in the courts, not in the federal court, especially state, county, you know, the disputes that never get up there, the disputes that shouldn't get there, there's a massive amount of injustice out there. Like, how big is it? Well, 95% of the people in California don't get access to it of all economic stripes, of all backgrounds. It's a completely diverse problem that the bar has failed to address. So I love the attempt to try to address you know, consumer needs and to help people in this way. Um, I think a lot of the time, and I'm not speaking about any particular company, there is an, in, in Silicon Valley, engineering, the tech, tech has its own hubris. And law shouldn't just be relegated to another kind of type of data. It is a special field. As I said, you can't just make, you know, generic statistical classifications of ethics rules. Like you have to use that. You have to use the AI to extract and gather and organize information and evidence. But it's the evidence that makes the case. So uh, I was in South Korea in um, 2014. Uh, AlphaGo, the uh, Google, uh, or one of the uh, one of the Go um, playing tools that were that came out of Google Brain, uh, that uh, uh, Andrew Ring, I think, was involved. And Andrew Ring was also involved in Las Machina back in the day, and, and thanks to him and, and Chris Manning and others for doing that. It terrified everyone because it was like, are are is AI now going to be doing judicial reasoning? And so the Supreme Court went out and they, um, we had a uh, uh, you know review of that. And my view was that having judges being replaced by robots is neither doable nor um, desirable. Uh, certainly not then, and, and I don't think it will ever be necessarily desirable. Using it to organize information, using it as an interface for how the courts interact with each other, absolutely. Stuff's happening in Brazil. South Korea also has a really good, you know, kind of handle your own lawsuit, you know, system where we're using um, good interfaces and things like that. So I think core systems have a duty to innovate and expand. And that, that duty is gonna grow massively um, because of the need of, for online mediation, uh, because of the need for, for stay at home and social distancing. Um, all of those technologies have to go further online and they have to become consumer friendly. They're not right now. It's a, it's a disaster and it's a travesty. And I think lawyers have to be engineers and creators to do that. So I, I love these ideas that are approaching it. Um, you have to be really careful and really ethical and you have to regulate it. Um, but I, I think it's a direction we have to go because even though there is risk in innovating, the risk of standing still means that the rest of our professions is to get nibbled and nibbled and nibbled away at, right? So that more and more is going to be done by consultants and accountants and other people and engineers, right? And and we can't let that happen because lawyers are good at this stuff, right? We can help a lot of people. We just need to scale ourselves. Uh, courts and systems have to start designing themselves better based on evidence, not 
not short-term rhetoric, right? Where we're aggregating these systems. Like we talk about vestigial contract clauses. What about vestigial laws? The total weight of laws that have been created at any given moment. Are they doing good? Are they doing what they're supposed to? Or are they, are people lying to themselves? Testing all these things. You know, assume all data are false or until proven otherwise. Assume the system is imperfect until we've tested it and assume that people need access to it in the way they access anything else, right? Um, legal systems can be worse than, you know, uh, people don't like the DMV. Litigation legal systems in, in California elsewhere can be vastly, vastly worse, and we're not doing anything about it. So we have to address this with infrastructure, uh, system design for nation states, states and, and countries, and there should be roles in that for lawyers to be creative. You see it in FinTech, right, in the financial companies, but it's the, it's the least served populations that have the greatest need for these types of things. So um, I absolutely, I think we should be doing that and addressing um, online mediation. Uh, whenever you touch consumer, you know, a consumer interface directly, it should be highly regulated. Um, but I think we have to address that and start addressing that market. And uh, anyway, happy, to, I don't know if there's time for more, but, uh, but I just wanna thank everyone for coming and uh, spending some time today, really appreciate it. Well, I think uh, I will do a last call. Uh, Joshua, if you have any kind of closing thoughts um, on anything you might want to talk about. Uh, yeah, again, it's um, a lot of it's the stories in the book. There's some talk about how you want to create these things. Um, one thing that I haven't mentioned, which goes to the last question, is um, there, there's just a, a toolkit for doing this. It's a, it's a recipe, right, called EDEN. EDEN stands for Empirical Design. Um, evolution net or evolution net. What it means is, you know, create an empirical framework for whatever law or system you're doing, whether it's a contract, it's a new legal system. Uh, we did a project for the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, uh, do these kinds of things all the time, where we're analyzing how would you create a simulated system for detecting fraud, you know, financial fraud, to avoid things like LIBOR manipulation and things like that. H how could you improve the habeas corpus processing and analysis system so fewer people die in prisons, right? And how do you get these things funded, right? So the, the habeas project is one we've been you know, dying to do for a long time. How do we find the resources to do that? Um, and, and maybe that's a, that's a big infrastructure play, right, to, to help people and, and, and manage the analysis that's required for any functioning system. So empirical, be empirical. What are you trying to achieve from this legal system or law or this contract or this legal artifact? Design. Put the end user first. So the consumer that gets ticketed, she or he needs to have the ability to contest it if, if something was done illegally, if somebody overstepped. We live in a democracy, uh, or a republic anyway. Uh, we should have the right to exercise our rights, and we don't functionally because we've been inefficient as lawyers and as, as, as governance leaders. Um, uh, you know, evolution, whatever you create is, is not done yet. You need to constantly sharpen the saw, constantly assuming that all your data are false until, uh, until proven otherwise, and constantly improve it. It never, ever, ever ends. It's just, you should think of yourself like an agile programmer, even if you're just drafting documents, and then net. What's the total cost of things? So, you know, with, with you know, innovating for traffic tickets, innovating for, you know, uh, smaller lawsuits in the U.S., is there risk there? Uh, absolutely. But the risk we're experiencing right now is that 95% of people are getting injustice, right? They're getting legal failure. So you have to net out um, all the different inputs to these things. So it's just a rule of thumb, you didn't, and, I, and I think you can apply it to, to legal practice, whether or not using a lot of technology, right? Um, end user in mind, et cetera. And being empirical. They don't necessarily care about the arcana and the law. They want to know what's the outcome and how it can help them and, and what their rights are. So be, being practical in that way. It's not, don't train that in law schools. Lastly, I just want to say, you know, next five years, like what's going to happen in the next five years, anyone that tells you they know what's going to happen in the next five years is going to be wrong. Right? <laughs> but by definition, the, guy, the people that say it's the end of history, those are the ones that are most definitely going to be in, incorrect. Um, we can count on uncertainty. We can count on a lot of pain. But I think everything we've been teaching and talking about today and working with Fast Case on and all the rest of it, those skill sets are going to become increasingly valuable. The technology-enabled stuff, finding new markets, finding ways to help people during COVID, 
that is going to require a lot of creativity, agility, and, and not just the status quo. When I graduated from law school, people said, ah, you always be jobs and you always be X, Y, Z. None of it was true in 2009. You don't have, we don't have those certainties right now. So we have our courage, we have our creativity, and we have our toolkits. And uh, we're just trying to help with the latter here. So, Ken, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. All right. Well, with that in mind, I, I don't know about everyone still remaining on the line with me, which is the majority of everyone. I appreciate you sticking it out for this session. I know we went a little long. Um, I hope you all learned something. Um, a couple of follow-up pieces. If you know someone that registered for this session but was unable to attend, just a reminder, I will be sending you out a recording. Um, a person pointed out I might have been talking too fast at the beginning to uh, remind everyone that if you have attended a previous work from home Wednesday session and you would like a recording and or the associated material, please send me an email uh, at support at fastcase.com. Um, for the next two weeks, we will be talking about next Wednesday. We're going to talk about how there is no profit in profiteering. Um, I am taking a week off, so that'll be led by our head librarian, Aaron Page, who's going to talk about case law, regulations, and executive orders regarding profiteering and supply hoarding, which is something that we will likely all find relevant in our current state. And then the week after that, we're going to talk about uh, a session I'm calling I Choose You, and we will be talking about can we really venue shop anymore? So if our AI, for example, shameless plug, ends up telling us that a certain judge or a certain um, legal matter is more, I apologize for the pinging, is more successful in certain courts. Are we allowed to venue shop any further in this day and age? So we'll talk about the current state of law around that and we'll also start uh, with a little bit of history around venue shopping. Um, so those are for the next two weeks. I hope you will all sign up. I will include links for those sessions in the follow-up email to this session. Otherwise, I'm going to wish Mr. Walker a hearty goodbye. Um, if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to pass them along, and I will hopefully be able to get you an answer of some sort. So everyone on the line, Mr. Walker, thank you all for coming out today for a session on AI, but why? Thanks so much, and we will see you next week. Thank you all. Thank you, Fast Case.